Hey, what's going on, everyone? And welcome uh, to another Readsy Live. It's our ongoing series of webinars where we bring on professionals from the world of publishing, be they authors, editors, designers, uh, to share their knowledge and uh, and uh, help you write and publish better books. Uh, today, we have with us Rebecca Heyman, who's been one of our longtime editors here at Readsy. Uh, she's going to be running one of her first line frenzies, which is uh, a monthly event that she's been running on Twitter for a while, where uh, folks like yourself send in the first line of your novel, and uh, she provides uh, honest, uh, useful feedback in uh, in a friendly, informative, uh, safe environment here. Hey, uh, first things first, uh, where are you today? I am outside of Boston, so a special hello to all of my fellow New Englanders. Um, we are bracing for winter here. It hasn't quite arrived, but it's coming. Should we get started? I think we should. This first one uh, from Sarah. Okay, so uh, Martin, can everybody else see what I'm seeing? Yes, I believe they can. Okay, great. So uh, the first thing I want to say is that I have not seen any of these in advance. So this is the same off the cuff feedback that you would get in a Twitter first line frenzy. And to that end, let's get started by uh, I will read this to you and let you know what I'm seeing as I see it. So a small smile twists my lips as I look out at the bewitching landscape. The land cracked and red, clear of the smoke from the blazing plain behind me, is overlooked by distant black hills accented by the blue and gold streaked sky. That's a lot of description. Um, the, this sentence, which is really two sentences, you're not fooling anybody with that semicolon, um, is really heavy on visual cues. And what I would tell Sarah is that you wanna consider some of the other senses that you can help us um, experience in your landscape. So this first clause about a small smile is completely irrelevant. Um, I don't know how many times you've looked out at a landscape and just smiled uh, and, and considered how bewitching it is, but it certainly never happened to me. Um, if you wanna start with the description of land, um, you wanna think about bringing us into the world instead of just um, showing us what the visual field kind of experiences. And so to that, I would say, uh, this doesn't really bring me into a conflict. It doesn't really give me a strong sense of voice. And frankly, it gives me too much sensory information. Next. <laughs> Let's be blood brothers, Blake pleaded. Okay, so I often discourage people from starting their books with dialogue. And part of the reason is because um, we don't really know who Blake is or, or who he's speaking to. And rather than... Um, making me wonder about the answers to those questions, I feel a little bit distanced from the manuscript. If you're gonna start with dialogue, it should be really pithy and uh, maybe even a play on a well-known turn of phrase. So while I'm, I guess, interested in who Blake is interested in swapping blood with, uh, I think that you could bring us into this moment maybe with the sensation of flesh being cut or, um, you know, bring us into the ritual of this without naming it, you know, as sort of baldly as this does. Next. Cool. Uh, that one uh, was from a book called Murder Go Lightly, a cozy mystery novel by uh, Sherry McEwen. I mean, it's a great title. And I think uh, as far as cozy mysteries goes, you know, you want to get us interested in in the uh, the empirical experience as quickly as possible so you're on the right track. Um, but go with sensation instead of just naming this ritual that doesn't really have a lot of meaning for us yet. Okay, the next one uh, comes from El Espiritu. Here we go. My mom named me Good Wednesday out of spite. I love this. Um, we're immediately drawn into uh, a kind of voiciness, right? Not so voicey that this feels um, like it's trying to keep me away, uh, but certainly you're drawing me into your confidence by sort of confessing something about you that's interesting and unique. So I think this is actually um, a really clever first line. It shows me there's some drama between uh, Good Wednesday and her mother, which is you know always an interesting motif to work with. And I think generally this is going to um, entice me to keep reading for sure. Uh, fantastic. That's from a book called Gwen Pierre and uh, the Big Boy Pants. Uh, it's apparently a young adult retelling of uh, Peter Pan. Oh, amazing. Okay. I think that's super exciting. And uh, I, I love that myth. 
uh, the uh, Peter Pan myth is actually far more complex and much darker than most people realize from the Disneyfied version most of us have, have consumed. And so uh, this gets a gold star for me. Cool. Uh, we've had some people mention that there's a, a follow Readsy block on the screen that seems to cover uh, some of the first sentence. I'm not getting on any of the screens I have, though. Someone has said that uh, if you change the size of your window, that might go away. Uh, so sorry, I can't particularly help you there, but uh, uh, just have a play around with that. Uh, our next one here uh, comes from Lynn Mickley. Uh, here we go. Jane stood in the truck stop vestibule facing the 24-hour cafe, the tantalizing smell of bacon and coffee wafting out to mock her hunger. Again, I think this is a home run. Um, you're hitting us with setting right away. Um, we all understand um, the, the setting here. Uh, but more importantly, this author has activated more than one sensory cue, right? We have a visual cue, uh, but we also have an olfactory cue, the tantalizing smell of bacon and coffee, which of course all of us can really quickly sort of identify with. Um, not only that, but Jane is telling us something about herself, which is that she's hungry, which is actually a fairly important thing to know. Uh, about this woman. And so I think this is another gold star for me. Good job. Cool, fantastic. Uh, that one's uh, The Marvels of Prairie Creek, uh, and she's listed as women's fiction. Women's fiction, okay. An, an interesting uh, generic category, probably a talk for another time. I will do another <laughs> Lazy Live about genre distinction sometime soon. Martin will have to get that on the calendar. <laughs> cool. Uh, the next one comes from Evita from Edinburgh. I preface it that way because I think it uses... Uh, some slight British terminology that could throw some people. Anyway, I'll throw it up. The smile dropped from Ellie's face first, then the mobile. It slipped from her hand, skimmed her jaw, and bounced on the countertop before falling flat, the sound of Beth crying still pouring from its speaker. The grammar here is a little wonky. Um, this first clause, the smile dropped from Ellie's face first, what we're trying to do is is use a zugma. A zugma is a fun uh, literary term where we're applying a verb to more than one noun. And so um, we're saying the smile dropped and so did the phone. But I think that the pithiness there is getting lost because of that hyphen, which should be an M dash. Um, there are other problems too. I think you need to reorder uh, this initial clause so that dropped is more clearly um, applied to both the smile and the phone. And so maybe you would want to say something like, um, uh, Ellie's smile dropped in the moment before her mobile slipped from her hand, or that doesn't really activate the zoom in the way you want to. Um, Ellie's smile dropped followed closely by her mobile, um, which skimmed her jaw and bounced on the countertop before fall, falling flat, et cetera, et cetera. That might be the way to go. Uh, just try to get both of the nouns a little closer to the verb. Cool. Uh, thank you, Avita, for sending that in. Uh, next one is another British one uh, from James Steele in Norfolk. Here we go. Rose realized immediately that something was wrong when Jack came home alone. Okay. So is this a Titanic retelling? Because if it's not, I think we need to talk about these names. I don't think anybody who was born after 1985 can hear the names Rose and Jack without thinking of the Titanic movie. And so uh, you might want to consider that. Um, Rose realized immediately that something was wrong when Jack came home alone. It's a fairly innocuous and interesting line. It doesn't totally light my fire. And I do find, uh, I find the twinning of Rose and Jack um, distracting. So from a pop culture standpoint, you have to understand the context in which you're writing. And so there's going to be a large readership that this triggers, you know, is this like a, a post Titanic rewrite where they both survive? I, I hope so. Uh, but if it's not, uh, then you might want to reconsider just how distracting that set of names is going to be for some readers. But otherwise, I think this is fairly uh, innocuous. It doesn't, it doesn't excite me, but it's not offensive. Cool. Uh, that was from the book As I Love You, uh, literary fiction from James Steele. As I Love You sort of makes me think that it could be an intentional nod towards Titanic. It could be. It could, and you know what? Some of us appreciate that. <laughs> uh, okay, our next one here uh, is from A.G. Little uh, from Woking. And sorry, God, we're hitting a bit of a real British block here. I uh, hope some of you guys are still awake. If you're awake, they deserve to have their lines up because that's Herculean as far as I'm concerned. Uh, frightened seagulls wheeled in the night sky. 
their raucous cries muted by the howling winds and thrashing rain. Yeah, okay. Again, I, I think this is um, a piece of scene work that is just a little blah. It doesn't really tell me a whole lot. You know, this is a little too close for comfort to it was a dark and stormy night, to be honest, right? We don't, we don't want to start with anything that feels cliched. How do we know the seagulls are frightened? I'm not really sure. If it is the night sky, how clearly can we really see them? Uh, if their cries are muted by the howling winds and thrashing rain, how can the narrator hear them to begin with? I have a lot more questions than I should um, just about the logistics of this line. And for that reason, I think it probably needs some rethinking. Cool. Uh, thank you, AG. Uh, our next one now. I'm sorry to give you another British one. I think it's British or someone who's having it set in, in, in Britain. All of us New England. Uh, here it is. There's some favoritism here, Martin. I'm just warning you. Uh, I, I, will, I think the sort of the, we do head back across the pond there in a minute now, but uh, here it is. From his position on the balcony of Covent Garden's Punch and Judy pub, Jack had a clear view of the man he came here to kill. Okay. Uh, you know, I feel good about this. It, it, what, one thing that authors should understand is that when you get hyper specific about setting, uh, particularly when we're talking about a contemporary place, um, you're going to exclude some readers who are going to feel less curious about these places and more uh, a sense of FOMO, right? A sense of missing out. Like, well, they don't really know what it means to be at the Punch and Judy uh, pub in Covent Garden. And so how important is it to articulate the name of that place when, let's say, a lot of your American readers aren't going to distill a lot of meaning from that context? So could you say something a little more dynamic about the setting? Uh, a pub is a pub is a pub for the purposes of this line. So is there something more important that you could say um, about this moment? But I, I like this. I think this is this is heading in the right direction for me. Cool. Uh, that's from a crime thriller called uh, Pressure Point. Yeah, great. I mean, I, I was going to say this is this is almost assuredly from a thriller, uh, and I think you're you're definitely on the right track if I can guess the genre from one line. Yeah, as someone who think have been to that pub, I think whoever Jack had come to kill is uh, eating the Shake Shack. Um, <laughs> and here's a uh, one uh, from Sarah. The front gate slammed shut, and Lexi woke with a start. Wah! We do not wake people up in. Uh, first lines or in first chapters or at the start of our book ever. Uh, it is cliche. You are not an exception to the rule. Nobody is. I have heard it all. Well, what if my character isn't really waking up, but just regaining consciousness after being knocked out? What if my character has been asleep for 900 years and is just coming to? I don't care. 99.9% .9 of the time, waking up is a snooze. So fast forward to whatever happens uh, for Lexi that is different than the norm. Waking up is normal. Show me what's different about today. Um, certainly I'm not interested in the sounds that wake people up or the dog slobber or, you know, the scary dreams. Stop waking people up at the beginning of your book. Next. Cool. And uh, next one's from Vern Brick. It was two beers past noon when the phrase bystanders were hit caught his attention like a fish hook in the cheek. Bravo. I love it. Um, this tells us so much about our protagonist. And notice we don't know his name, right? Um, we just know that he's a day drinker and uh, he is attuned to the news and uh, to this specific tragedy that has just occurred. I'm curious about the tragedy. I'm curious about the protagonist. I love everything about this. Gold star. Fantastic. That's uh, from Delusions of Clarity, a uh, literary mystery. Delusions of Clarity is a great title. And I can tell you that the agents of my acquaintance are constantly on the lookout for literary thrillers and literary mystery. It's one of the most asked for genres that I hear about from uh, the literary agents of my acquaintance. Fantastic. Uh, next one comes from Hadia in uh, Lahore, Pakistan. It all ends on the 21st of May, or at least I think it does. So keep in mind that uh, numbers are hyphenated between the tens and the ones, so 21st should be hyphenated. It all ends on the 21st of May, M dash, not ellipses, or at least I think it does. I I'm interested in this. Um, it, as a first word, is a little weak. 
So I, if you could be a little more specific about what it is standing in for, keep in mind always that it is a pronoun and without a, a reference noun, right? Without an antecedent, it really doesn't have a lot of meaning. It's just a stand in for something else but you're not telling us what that something else is. So if you can adapt this a little bit to eliminate it, I think you would have a much stronger opening line. Cool, uh, that's from a fantasy novel called The Time Curve. Thanks, Hadia, for sending that one in. Uh, the next one comes from Patricia, uh, who I believe actually is here. I saw her coming in earlier. Hello, uh, Mandy Lynn Snow was running for her life, her crimson real estate blazer flapping in the wind when her cell phone beeped that a text had come in. Okay. Um, I have mixed feelings about surnames in uh, first lines or really in any kind of immediate character building because they don't provide a lot of context unless you're talking about a world in which last names have significance, like a, if we're talking about a royal family or if we're in a Game of Thrones situation where the last name Snow would signal something important to us. Um, so let's even say Mandy Lynn was running for her life, her crimson real estate blazer flapping in the wind when her cell phone beeped that a text had come in. My challenge here is that if she's running for her life, is she really hearing the phone? Um, I guess I'm interested, but I'm not thrilled by this encroachment of the cell phone on whatever this moment is. I'm, I'm more, I'd like to know more about Mandy and her situation and less about her text messages. I, I'm not sure that anyone is checking their phone in this scenario. And so this kind of challenges my uh, suspension of disbelief a little too strongly. Cool. And um, that was a, ooh, I quite like the name of her series. It's her Unreal Estate series. Uh, one Crooked House. So I think uh, it's... Uh, I, mean, I mean, the title is completely on point and I love it. Uh, so I would I would work on uh, just the specificity of the first line a little bit, but you've nailed the title. Okay, we have a, a comment coming in from Karen. Oh, let's wait. Uh, how about first names and first lines? Uh, or is it a simple she, he, I, they better in the opening line? I actually like a first name in a first line if we're looking specifically at one character. Uh, I tend to feel that the use of pronouns in first lines can feel too vague uh, and a little overly stylized. So I'm I'm perfectly happy with first names or um, honorifics with proper surnames. So, you know, Mrs. Heyman sat at her desk, uh, you know, staring at her own reflection in the screen. It gives me a little something to attach to and might help you set a tone um, for the rest of your novel. Cool. Uh, next one up uh, is from Lee Dunning. Here we go. Spring had come to the abyss. Okay. Uh, you know, this is another one of these lines that is really innocuous, which is to say, it's nothing to write home about. It's, I wouldn't slash it out. There's nothing inherently wrong with this. Um, but I don't know anything about what the abyss is or if this is a space opera or if this is a fantasy. Um, you're not giving me enough information. And so another way to approach this might be to show me the um, the arrival of spring or sort of the way winter leaves, right? So instead of just telling me spring had come to the abyss, you could show me something happening uh, that signals the coming of spring in this specific world where the coming of spring might look a lot different. So here in New England, I might talk about, um, you know, the year's first crocuses had finally broken through um, the the still frozen soil or something like that. Uh, so that tells you a little something about where I am. And it's a very specific signal about the changing season. So I, I would I would ask you to get a little bit more specific here and a little bit more activated. Cool. And uh, we had another question come in related to an earlier point you made. Ken Barrett asks, uh, how about opening with a dream? Wah, wah. No, thanks. <laughs> no, thank you. I generally really dislike dreams, nightmares anywhere in the book. Um, sometimes they're important, but most often they are they are a lot of navel gazing, right? Oftentimes the inclusion of a dream or a nightmare is more about showing us how clever you can be with a motif than with actually advancing the plot in any appreciable way. So I'm gonna take a hard pass. Uh, I had one that was going to share, uh, but the sentence was being pushed really to its limits to the point where I can't share it on screen. Oh, hey there. <laughs> Who's that? That's Gabe, that's my son. We said goodnight, but he wanted another goodnight. I love you. you got, I gotta talk to these people about their books. 
All right, go on, go. Does Gabe want to take this one? <laughs> he can't read yet, but no. you know, soon, very soon, he's going to be in the family business. Uh, this has come in from Junie Fisher. She cocks her hip, one arm raised high, and the audience roars approval once more, then flicks her hand to signal the light man to swing the spotlight away. Audience roars approval once more, then flicks her hand to signal the light man to swing the So there's a lot happening here physically. I had to read it twice just to sort of digest what's going on here. Um, so I understand that this is a performance moment. We have an audience. We have a kind of dramatic posture. Um, the grammar is a little squicky because um, you've named a new noun, which is the audience, right? And then you have this pronoun, her, then flicks her hand. So technically that pronoun actually refers to its nearest named noun, right? So we're talking about the audience, not she, whoever she is. So this is just a little too busy for me. It's physically mm, frenetic and just a little, it's a little too much. So I would say, uh, maybe combine the one arm raised high with the flick of the hand, eliminate the hip gesture, and uh, put the audience noise in the background instead of giving it such a potent place at the center of the sentence. Cool. Uh, that was from The Band Played On, uh, and she has put it there as upmarket fiction. Uh, what does that mean to you? Upmarket fiction is uh, sometimes called book club fiction. Upmarket is a way to signal that there's a certain um, literary sensibility without being literary. It's usually very plot driven, but with a literary finish on the style. It's a really broad category and it's okay to categorize your fiction that way. Um, it is a branch of sort of general fiction or commercial fiction. Uh, cool. Oh, the next one comes from Joshua Insull, who I believe uh, actually won one of our uh, weekly uh, writing prompts competition. Uh, it's good to see you here, Joshua. Uh, here we go. The night that Charlie died was a cold one. Yeah, okay. I mean, it kind of makes Charlie or the night that he died sound like a beer. Uh, so I think uh, the fact that <laughs> the night was cold doesn't really tell me anything about Charlie's death unless he died of hypothermia or he froze in the snow. Again, this is one of those lines that's just kind of innocuous. It's not doing enough heavy lifting, and we want a first line to do a lot of heavy lifting. So I'd love to know if this was the first cold night of the season. I'd love to know if this was the last cold night before spring. Um, there are just more interesting ways to give me this information that can do more work for your book. Cool. Thank you. Uh, that was uh, from A Sissy in Autumn, uh, horror with bits of sci-fi. Thanks for sending that in, Joshua. Uh, oh, the next one I quite like. Um, oh, the I'm actually, I be biased now? Okay. The day began at three minutes past nine with Schumann's fourth symphony, but by 927 it had progressed to murder. Whew. Okay. Um, great. You know, I think this is a really interesting way to use time, right? You know that time in your novel um, has a lot to do with tension and how the audience feels the passage of time can have a lot to do with their general impressions of the pacing and tone of your book. So uh, this sentence has a lot to do with time. Uh, and so I would only suggest to the author that um, if that focus on the passing of time is critical, then you've done the right thing. If this is just a way to draw us into the moment, I, I'm not sure it's super effective. This is a situation where I might actually ask to see line two before I made uh, sort of a final verdict about line one. It's an interesting line, but it is hyper-focused on time. And so as long as that's intentional, I think this line is very effective. Like when that sort of like timeline is so important, is like, is there is it better to sort of style your your numbers like that because when all those numbers are sort of written out it can be tough for me to sort of actually make sense of it yeah so i would prefer them done this way i wouldn't want to see um like roman digits uh anywhere here uh and i think most traditional publishers would feel the same way though every house has their own style um certainly i think this line would look quite choppy just visually sort of truncated if this were you know, 
actual numbers. I also think that the author is doing something interesting by saying three minutes past nine instead of 903. So there's no way to express three minutes past nine in, in those terms using digits. Um, and so I think for, for in that way, this is an effective line. Um, but why say three minutes past nine instead of 903? A great question, uh, especially when there's an inversion, right? But then by 927, it had progressed to murder. So again, I have a lot of questions about the representation of time here. And if that is um, a critical part of of what's happening here, then great. But if I'm just distracted for the sake of being distracted, that's not so great. Cool. Uh, moving swiftly along, the next one comes from Lisa Lickle. On the first achingly bright morning of summer, Lily Masters slowly opened her robe. So we do need a comma after summer um, because on the first achingly bright morning of summer is a dependent clause, right? The independent clause is Lily Masters slowly opened her robe. We have our subject and our verb and it's a complete sentence. And so uh, the prepositional phrase that, or the, 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 the phrase that begins on the first achingly bright morning of summer uh, is dependent. So get a comma in there. Eh. Unless her robe has been closed for the last 150 years, I don't know why it's especially important that she's opening it now. I don't know why the opening of the robe is linked to the first achingly bright morning of summer. So you're 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 suggesting a kind of causation here, or, or at least a correlation, and I don't know what it is or why it would be so. Uh, so I have more questions about this than I should. I think it probably needs to be reworked. Cool. Uh, that's from Undercut, a romantic suspense novel, uh, which leads me to believe this is probably uh, starting in media res. Um, yes. Okay, our next one here uh, is from Kimberly Dredger from Missoula, Montana. Uh, here we go. The disintegration had been slow and insidious. First, the single vitamin bottle in the cabinet was replaced by prescription bottles, which multiplied, spilling onto the counter. Uh, how do I feel about that semicolon? I feel good about it. The disintegration had been slow and insidious. So a semicolon suggests that what follows can't be completely understood without what came before. And so that close link uh, is, is what we're really looking for with a semicolon. Unfortunately, the strength of sentence one, which is a very good sentence, um, is somewhat diminished by the sprawling slowness of sentence two. When you say first, I expect to see second. And so I think you'd be uh, wise to reconsider the part of the sentence that begins which multiplied. So the disintegration had been slow and insidious semicolon. First, the single vitamin bottle vitamin bottle in the cabinet uh, was replaced by prescription bottles. And second, da 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 da, -da give me, or, you know, and second, those bottles had multiplied, spilling onto the counter. Treat them as two separate acts. Uh, if you start me with a first, I expect to see a second. Cool. Uh, that one uh, was from uh, yeah, Begin Again, uh, another women's fiction entry. Uh, thanks very much, Kimberly, for sending that one in. Uh, the next one. And wants to tell us if this is a novel about dementia or memory loss. I would be interested to know that. Anyway. Okay. Uh, uh, Kimberly, if, uh, if you're here, let us know if we're along the right lines there. Uh, next one we have uh, from Janet Pearson. The eyes of the cougar sent an unrecognizable chill into Cassidy before she even knew she was being stalked. Well, one of the challenges I have here is that we've sort of now disembodied a, an organ, right? The eyes of the cougar have a lot of agency. They themselves sent an unrecognizable chill into Cassidy, but if it's unrecognizable, how can it be named? Uh, before she even knew she was being stalked. The sentence grammatically is a little fuzzy, and I might uh, consider that an unrecognizable chill can't be articulated, right? So um, I, I would focus more on, Ca on what Cassidy can feel and experience uh, and that moment of awareness when she does realize she's being stalked. I think maybe you're just coming in a beat or two too early uh, in terms of drawing us into this first moment of tension and action. 
Cool. Uh, we have uh, another comment from Ellen Callahan. She says uh, she appreciates the grammar and punctuation comments. Ellen, uh, you are welcome. Uh, it's very, very important that writers learn how to use their primary tools. And if you are writing in any language, it is your duty to learn the mechanics and the grammars of that language. Grammar is an agreed upon system that helps us understand each other. And so it is not optional, especially if you want to write books. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, coming up next, we have uh, something from Frank from Long Island. The massive coach pulled by four sleek horses was just outside Camberwell when its sole passenger began to stir from her absinthe induced stupor. Mm, okay. Not important that the coach is massive. Nix it. You've already told us that it's pulled by four sleek horses. So we know that um, this is an image of wealth. So you don't have to be redundant. Uh, the size of the coach is less important than the fact that it's pulled by the coach, by, the, by these horses. And I think that does the work of massive. Just outside of Camberwell, when its sole passenger began to stir from her absinthe induced, needs to be hyphenated because it's acting as an adjective modifying stupor, right? Because you could just say, uh, began to stir from her stupor. So we know absinthe induced is an adjective phrase and you should hyphenated. Uh, but I, I like this. I think it's an interesting way to tell us something about the person inside the carriage, um, that she is likely, he or she, no, she, she that she is likely uh, wealthy or perhaps have been kidnapped by a wealthy person. I'm intrigued. Cool. And that was from The Race for an Earl, uh, a Regency romance. Oh, yeah, it was. Regency romance, one of my absolute most favorite genres. Uh, if I am not working or, you know, reading, actually, uh, physically reading a book, I am probably listening to a Regency romance as I sort of totter around the house and cook and clean and take care of my family. So, uh, great. Glad to see it. As a, as a London native, uh, the thing that sticks out for me is Camberwell, which is sort of like, it's a sort of crummy neighborhood that sometimes is used as a punchline for jokes here. Okay, so that's actually a really important thing, right? So uh, Americans who read Regency, and I guess uh, I can't speak for all Americans, and of course I can't speak for people who are elsewhere in the world, but um, those kinds of cues don't mean anything to me. And so I can appreciate the sentence for what it is without knowing that that's a kind of wink nod. And I think it's especially okay to include those kinds of things in a genre like Regency, where there is an understanding um, that uh, place is very important within those novels. So I think this is actually a, a fairly good inclusion of that sort of regional neighborhood specific detail that I was talking about before that might not mean something to everyone, but the people to whom it does have meaning will really understand something important. So I, I would keep that just as is. Um, okay, I've got actually something, uh, Kimberly, who had that one a few ago uh, about the vitamin bottles. Uh, yeah. A comment on that one. Uh, one of the characters deals with memory loss due to traumatic brain injury. But not the character referred to here. Thanks for asking. I, uh, yeah, I think it was the use of the word insidious that kind of got me thinking um, about memory loss. Memory loss is a uh, is often described that way. And so you definitely had my brain going in the right direction. Even if there's a little bit of a, of a misfire on exactly which character we're talking about here, you certainly activated uh, one of your motifs really cunningly. So good job. Uh, cool, here's our next one. Uh, comes from David Reem. I was pretty sure that the sound waking me up. Mm, <laughs> oh, sorry. Going, but you're getting, mm. I was pretty sure that the sound waking me up was a helicopter. But when you live in the sticks, there are a lot of things that you have never actually seen or heard except on television. So the sticks as, as a term, like the boondocks is, is not capitalized. If the sticks is an actual place here, like, you know, district 13 and hunger games, then you're right to capitalize it as is. Um, the voice here is very casual, which is fine. Um, I would guess that this is, YA based on the narrative mode, right? First person. Um, I don't know. Waking up. It's never going to light my fire. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I just fast forward me 10 minutes. Fast forward me 10 minutes to whatever is going on after this person wakes up to a sound that they've never heard 
uh, before and 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 see how things go when you start there instead of starting here. That's what I would recommend. Cool. Uh, yeah, that is uh, from a sci-fi novel called Hello World. Uh, I get the feeling it's probably a bit of a dystopian one, so you, I think you're along the right lines there, maybe. If the um, author is present and wants to tell us, we are always interested in finding out, especially if we're right. Uh, okay. Actually, uh, was it? I got a question that sort of turned up that may tie it into our next one. Uh, Mike asks, uh, "What about very short first lines in general? Uh, you didn't like any of them so far, but the two sh are the two short sentences worse than one sentence twice as long, e.g., for an action slash exciting opening?" You know, I have I have seen some really dynamic, excellent, short, pithy first lines. But again, a first line is is doing a lot of heavy lifting. Um, there's there's so much that has to happen in line one, and so doing it in a few words is just more of a challenge. Uh, if like me, you're obsessed with you know reality TV cooking shows, then you know that cooking something simple is a big risk, right? Because every component has to be perfect, and even just a little bit of of missing salt can cause something simple to just collapse. So. I think it's okay to have a really short first line, but I think you have to be super confident that it's doing the work you need it to do. And and to that I say, it depends. It can be done. There's absolutely, I don't wanna just see long lines for the sake of length. Uh, I wanna see strong lines with uh, powerful verbs and very specific nouns. And that kind of language choice is gonna make a short sentence have a great impact. Uh, yeah, and that actually more than one way uh, segs us nicely into this next one from uh, Amelia. <laughs> My soup is ruined, and here I'm talking about cooking shows. You could not have set this up better. Um, My soup is ruined. Okay, but how or why? Um, I would love just a little bit more information. Uh, you know, is this is this soup that came out of a can and? You microwaved it in the aluminum can and now the whole microwave is on fire. Um, is the soup ruined because you mistook sugar for salt? Um, you know, give me something a little bit more specific and, and activated. Uh, I am intrigued by details. And so I would love to know uh, what it is that actually destroyed the soup. Soups can be very forgiving. So I'd really like to know what the death knell of this particular soup was. Uh, well, that uh, was from Crush on You, a contemporary romance. Great. Uh, Again, I love romance. I know Martin is going to ask me later about what I like to edit, and I wish all of you uh, looking for freelancers on Readly would send me more romance. So, you know, rom com it up and, uh, you know, ruin the soup, destroy the cake, get locked in a walk in freezer, whatever it is. I love uh, the antics and the shenanigans, and, uh, you know, tell me details. I want to know. Cool. Uh, next up, uh, this is a mu from Michael from Manchester. The city center has been masticated and spat out into an infinite number of pieces. Condom wrappers, takeaway wrappers, flyers for mediocre wrappers, <laughs> Rizla papers, newspapers, self-shamers, hell's neighbors. Uh, so there's so much rhythm, obviously. This almost reads like spoken word. Um, there's beautiful interior rhyme here. There's a lot of just movement and action um, at the line level, right? Not big action like bodies moving or explosions happening, but but action uh, within the line that makes it easy and enticing to read. Um, I'm not sure how effective the chewed up and spit out analogy is here, right? Uh, I think that there's another way to say that the city has been used and used up uh, that might be more effective. I would like to see that initial metaphor uh, a little pithier, a little tighter so that the, the list can shine uh, so that the items in series can shine brighter because uh, that's obviously really where the play is in this sentence. And so I would I would get the point across faster in that initial clause. And again, I, I would rethink the uh, chewed up and spit out. I, I don't think that's the right. Um, I don't think that's the right descriptive language here. Cool. Uh, thank you very much. That was from morning. Thank you, Michael, for sending that one in if, uh, if you're still up. Uh, next one here, we have uh, from Peter Kingsmill from Canada, who I think I saw him around as well. 
Anderson didn't like burying people, but he was fond of Susie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I think he's burying Susie or he's burying somebody for Susie. That is really unclear. And as you can tell, a really critical distinction. So I think we're on to something here. Um, but I think we need a, just a smidge more specificity about who Susie is and whether or not she's the person being buried or perhaps the person on whose behalf Anderson is burying somebody else. Cool. Uh, that was from Nobody Drowned, uh, which piece calls a, a Canadian cozy, a very, very important distinction. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Still, you know, we'd like to know if Susie is at least dead or alive. I can probably tell you she's Canadian. <laughs> uh, okay, the next one we have uh, is from Genem from the Netherlands. Any city built on ancient ruins had its secrets, and Shadow Kissed, the deadliest one of all, was sharpening her blade. So, I'm confused because uh, we're saying that any city built on ancient ruins had its secrets. So, Shadow Kissed grammatically is the name of a city, not a person, but a city can't sharpen her blade. Uh, mm, this is a bit of a humdinger for me. I think there's a misfire. If this is an analogy and we are referring to Shadow Kissed, which is a city as a she, uh, I'm confused. I think just the grammar here is is a little um, impenetrable. And so I, I would modify a little bit to be more clear about about who or what Shadow Kissed actually is. Cool, uh, okay, I'm sort of conscious of time. I've got a bunch more here, so I'm gonna start cherry picking them a little bit. Okay. Um, we'll hopefully go maybe for another, maybe hopefully just under 10 minutes, uh, but here's our next one. I had hired a limousine for the four of them, a stretch black sedan similar to the vehicle that in a few months would carry just three of them. Okay. I think it's nice that you're planting a central mystery, uh, the disappearance of the fourth person. Um, I'm not in love with the repetition of the pronoun them. I think it's a little weak. If you can modify this to be more specific about how we can classify these people, whether they all have the same job or whether or not they all have the same gender, maybe they're four women, maybe they're four stockbrokers, maybe they're four I don't know. But if you can give me a little bit more about who these people are, I would care more about the fact that one of them disappears. Cool. Uh, the mystery of the Canadian cozy has uh, been illuminated a bit. Uh, the guy being buried is Keith, Susie's uh -huh. husband. Yes. Okay. So, great. It's it's really important to at least know that someone's being buried on Susie's behalf, I think. All right. Moving on All right. to the next <laughs> one. Uh, we have this one uh, from Elizabeth Roberts. I'm not seeing anything yet. Are you not? Mm -mm. Okay, let me try and take that off and back on. Can you see it? Nope. Okay, this is an interesting turn of events. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, okay. I have something now, Etta. Okay, yep. Okay, Etta Bernard loved her five children. Not equally, no. She knew people who said they loved each of their children equally who were lying to themselves. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, this is a situation where I think using a first and last name actually does a nice bit of um, vocal uh, tone setting. So I like this here. Um, there should be another M dash after no. The phrase not equally comma no should be offset as a dependent or a parenthetical phrase. So you can go ahead and replace that second comma in line one with another M dash. And then I think uh, we have a really nice opening line here. Cool, and uh, that was from A Mother's Birthright, uh, which classed as literary fiction. Okay. And uh, we have a, a comment from uh, Pippa. You need to do this early for the UK time next time. Off to bed. I'm sorry. Time to I know, I'm Pippa. Kid, I know. So it is a little tough for me to do something at three in the afternoon, but we'll try to find maybe a Saturday when we can do it on proper UK time. Amazing. Uh, here's one uh, from Ellen Ann Callahan. Uh, Lucy Holiday was 25, never married, and still getting accustomed to her fourth name. Oh, yeah, okay. But uh, hmm, fourth name, 
is a little curious because we have Lucy Holiday. And so if we're talking about a complete uh, different name, like an identity change, that's sort of the impression I get here. But if it's a fourth name as in a name added to her, her own name that keeps morphing into new names, uh, then we would obviously need to see a different name at the outset. Uh, Lucy Holiday would have 10 more components. So if I'm right that this is a complete transformation and it's a totally new name, 25 never married and still getting accustomed to her fourth name, very cool. Um, I'm interested in Lucy and I'm interested in why she has this um, you know, naming problem or naming habit. Uh, so great first line, really good. Cool. Uh, it's a mystery. So I suspect you're right. You may have had some name changes. Yeah. Okay. Maybe, maybe a little witness protection. You never know. Lucy Holiday. Okay. Okay. Next one from Amity Who in Texas. Could you go to prison for reaching through a phone line and strangling someone? So we get a nice hit of voice right at the front. Uh, we know this person might be short tempered. We know that they are um, kind of sarcastic and pithy. So I feel pretty good about this. Um, gives me a, a little bit of a chuckle, and I would keep reading. Cool. Uh, I've got one here from J. Marthy Blevins. I never thought of death as being a living, breathing thing until now. Uh, you know. Okay. Uh, I, it feels a little bit like you're trying to go, gotcha. Um, and I don't, I don't love that feeling. I think, um, you could activate this a little more effectively by saying, um, you know, death was a living, breathing thing, comma, show me how that's true. And then maybe end with another dependent clause, like, um, or, or, or working in somewhere else, this idea of, um, I never thought this way until now. So um, unbeknownst to me until this moment, death was a living, breathing thing, comma, and then activate it. Show me how death is a living, breathing thing, because otherwise this is just a little bit of a generalized cliche. Uh, cool. Um, let's see. That was from, sorry, uh, life of a living, breathing thing. That was from Daughters of New Eden. Uh, this next one's from Kate Johnson. I'm going to do two more. Okay. Uh, Bryn ignored the wolf whistles as she stepped onto the wrestling mat and the stench of anticipation assaulted her nose like gasoline vapors. I love this. Um, setting is right there. Uh, you're telling us something about our protagonist, that she has grit. She's a wrestler. How interesting. Um, she's either a wrestler or she's someone involved in the wrestling match somehow. But I, I feel like the wolf whistles indicate that she is actually here to wrestle, which I love. Uh, generally, I hate the notion of of smells assaulting people. I see this all the time. Uh, it just makes smells seem extremely aggressive. But I think in this context and with this analogy, like gasoline vapors, this is probably one of the better uses of that verb in that context that I've seen. So I love this. Okay. And then our final one for the evening. But stick around. We've got some good stuff to share with you. So don't disappear just yet. Uh, our last one here comes from Sam in India. Mother died and took the memories with her. Beautiful. Um, I would be surprised if this isn't literary fiction. It feels um, very quiet. And, and here's an example of a short line that does a lot of heavy lifting. Um, the formality of mother as opposed to mom uh, or mama. Um, this idea that there's something unknown that can never be known because of the mother's death. I think this does a lot of work to set a stage here. And so this is really well done. 